Hello and welcome everyone. Um, just getting ourselves situated with the PowerPoint for today. And this is uh, Mark Durgan, uh, the director for the PA Care Partnership, while Kelsey is getting the presentation up and running. Um, first and foremost, a, a big welcome to everybody who is on the call. Um, we had a uh, great um, registration for this. I think we had about uh, um, just, uh, just over 70 people register for the event. So um, we look forward to this. And um, Kelsey, I will turn it over to you um, for the presentation on understanding social media bullying, bias, and microaggressions, part of our cultural linguistic series from the PA Care Partnership. Thank you very much. So just some uh, tech uh, housekeeping. Can everyone see the PowerPoint as full screen or taking up uh, the screen for the webinar? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. So, um, I think we have some new admits. So, hello and, and welcome everyone. Uh, this is Understanding Social Media Bullying, Bias, and Microaggressions. Um, thank you for joining our third and final installment of our Cultural and Linguistic Competency webinar series. Um, so my name is uh, Kelsey Leonard, and I am the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Care Partnership. If um, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I wanted to be sure to include um, a photo of myself so that you're able to be oriented to what I look like. Um, if we ever do um, meet in the future or you see me around, please come up and say hello. Um, also, if there are questions after today's um, webinar related to additional resources or technical assistance or um, further insights on a particular topic, um, please feel free to email me. This is my email, leonardkt at upmc.edu. So some of our objectives for our session today. Uh, firstly is to understand how social media uh, creates virtual spaces in which new forms of bullying are um, arise and, and really how that's impacting um, our work within systems of care and, and, and more broadly maybe in our daily lives. It's also to discuss what systems of care can do to address social media bullying bias and microaggressions. Um, we obviously don't have um, a magic solution to some of these concerns that are uh, consistently um, arising within our communities now, um, but we will uh, provide you with some insight into some of the ways in which we could be addressing uh, the, these concerns. And really, you all have entered into the first step and on this journey of building your competency, which really is to um, build these knowledges, build your, your educational background related to some of these topics. So uh, you're well on your way to, to helping us collectively address many of these, these issues. Uh, we're also going to explore the culture of social media um, and have a bit of a discussion around what we what we think that means and, and how it's um, maybe uh, changing uh, in our society. We're going to learn about tools for limiting bullying bias and microaggressions in our online world. So um, if you've been joining with us for these uh, webinars, um, webinars as a part of our CLC series, you've probably seen this slide before and particularly this question. Um, but I do think it's really important um, to, because we do have probably some new attendees, to always just have a refresher. And especially today when we're thinking about social media, um, the culture of social media and how it's influencing our lives, to be able to properly answer that question, we need to answer, um, the overarching question of what is culture? How do we define culture? Um, so if you'll take some time and just in the chat box, um, type in your thoughts on what is culture, we would really appreciate that.
Okay, we've got a few responses in the chat box. Um, and Mark, just for a tech question, are you still able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am, we are. Okay, great. So um, someone's background and upbringing, family makeup and tradition, one of the building blocks of a person, uh, cultures, your surroundings, people with similar beliefs and ideals, beliefs, morals, values, institutions, the arts, achievements and uh, within a group or of a group. Um, yes, these are all really strong uh, contributions to our understanding of culture. Uh, the traditions and values that are passed on through generations, I, I feel like there's a few folks that um, have been par participating along the way, so we're really getting our definitions of culture down, which is fantastic. Um, so these are all great. Combined together, they do really make up our definition. Our culture is a combination of our heritage, background, language, social and economic status, geographic location, religion, and gender, definitely. Um, so if we, if we really take everything that all of you have put into the chat box, that is a, a clear definition. Of what of of how we should be defining culture, or really even thinking about culture, because I don't want to say that there's a set definition. I think cultures and our understandings of culture are continuously evolving, and I think you'll see that even today when we explore what culture means in the context of social media. So culture is a set of attitudes, values, and uh, beliefs, symbols, and behaviors shared by a group of people, but different for each individual and usually communicated from one generation to the next. And so each of you really touched on different components of this definition. So again, combined, we really start to have a fuller picture of what culture means in, um, in our world today. Uh, one of the things I like to share with folks, if you haven't seen this before, maybe if you've done uh, um, trauma-informed um, trainings before, you might have seen the trauma iceberg. I call this the cultural iceberg. Um, where really it's um, a very similar understanding that there are things that sit above the surface. Um, just like with an iceberg, there are things that may be readily apparent about someone's culture. Maybe you think it's their race or the, their behaviors or their language or gender actions. And in reality, sometimes those uh, can be less apparent than people might think they are in terms of perception. Um, but then there are also a lot of more, a lot more things that get to be very tricky um, and sit beneath the surface. Maybe are less readily apparent. Things like our our, our abilities and our age and um, our values, our philosophies, our sexual orientation, our um, religion, um, lived experiences, and a plethora of other things that make up our cultural identities. Um, and so, although there are some markers here on this image, um, they're not, it's not an exclusive list of all the things that make up um, our unique cultures. Um, also, as we get into our conversation today, I wanted you to have a definition of cultural competence. We've discussed it more in depth on previous webinars and all of our webinars have been um, posted online um, to the pacarepartnership.org website. So really encourage you to go there if you'd like to hear more of our previous discussions around defining cultural competence. But a big part of cultural competence is the state of being capable of functioning effectively in the context of cultural differences. Now we're also seeing an evolution in language within systems of care and within mental and behavioral health more broadly um, across the nation to say that we actually need to be doing more than just being culturally competent. We need to be working towards one having cultural humility, so the, the, the which is the ability to um, uh, to act with, with humility, to to have humbleness um, as we um, learn and educate and build foundational knowledges around all of the different cultures that make up um, the world and the communities that we live in, and also to then take with that cultural humility um, the uh, level of responsiveness to the to those unique cultural identities within our communities so that we can be culturally responsive and not and not only culturally competent um, so there's, there's these evolution of words you may hear those three um, used sometimes interchangeably although they do have varied meanings um, i like to see it as um, as sort of pieces of, of an evolutionary um, process um, that you can't really have one without the other, but that we really need to be striving um, in sort of to reach a higher level of consciousness and, um, and competency throughout our work. Um, there's some additional definitions there um, for, for your reference. 
but I also don't want to leave off the aspects of linguistic competency. Sometimes when we're talking about cultural and linguistic competency, we, we center very heavily on culture and don't think about linguistic. Um, and so linguistic competency is the capacity of an organization and its personnel to communicate effectively and convey information in a manner that is easily understood by diverse audiences, including persons of limited English proficiency, those who have low literacy skills or are not literate, and individuals with disabilities. And this is really important when we start to think about social media and when we start to think about technology um, and the evolutions and technological advancements that are happening within our society, um, we uh, also need to take into account the way in which technology is creating greater divides um, in terms of those who have access to technology, those who don't have access to technology, um, and there's multiple layers and scales to that access. Um, it's no longer um, just about in terms of your access to technology, whether or not you have a cell phone, but it's also about whether or not you have um, a cell phone that can operate um, within the existing culture of technology that we have in 2019. So if you have a cell, someone asks you, oh, do you have a cell phone? And you say yes, but you're using a flip phone that maybe was a generation created in 2010, you don't have the same level of access to, uh, to technology that someone who's using the most recently, maybe even pre-released version of an iPhone in 2019. In the same way that you might have access to a laptop, but you're using a version of Microsoft Word that doesn't have the same functionalities because it's from 2010, versus 2019. And so there's these really um, gaping instances of inequality that can happen within technology and within the software, uh, the software uh, for technology um, that's really reshaping the types of conversations we are having today. Um, in behavioral and mental health care, this could also be uh, the use of electronic platforms for medical records, for accessing records, you know, what does that look like in terms of youth and families accessibility to those platforms and to those um, uh, different forms of technology? So that starts us off with the first part of today's presentation, which is to take a closer look at cyberbullying, um, which the definition for, and this is a, uh, you know, there are, there are many definitions for cyberbullying. This is, I, I think, a, a fairly strong one, um, but it's consistently evolving. Um, but it's the process of being cruel to others by sending or posting harmful material using technological means. An individual or group that uses information and communication involving electronic technologies to facilitate deliberate and repeated harassment or threat to an individual or group. It's often known, um, it can also be referred to as electronic bullying or um, online social cruelty. Now, there's also uh, different forms of technology, and I'll, I, I'll have a sort of a query for you towards the end of this, um, which is to really say that um, some of the technologies that are being used, email, uh, cell phones, um, social media, um, there are, or it can be the creation of defamatory personal websites, um, defamatory online personal polling websites, um, we're also seeing polling being introduced to different aspects of social media like Facebook and, um, and Twitter. And so you might want to, um, that, those might be uh, polling, uh, polling frames within those social media uh, platforms may be being utilized for cyberbullying. Um, chat rooms, they still exist. They're not as prevalent, but sometimes um, uh, we might, there might be the creation of, of, of a, a website like a, a Tumblr or a Reddit that's specifically dedicated to this uh, kind of um, uh, cyberbullying and it, um, you know, sort of taking on maybe what you might formerly have known as uh, a lot of the chat room bullying that was uh, occurring in sort of the mid to, uh, to mid 2000s ish. Um, but we're seeing some evolution, but keeping that there uh, as a note, blogs. And I'm curious if you have experience of other technologies or forms of social media bullying that you think should be on the radar in terms of systems of care. So if you could go to your chat box and maybe just type in um, 
experiences that you know of or that you personally had with cyberbullying and sort of what was the mode of technology that was being deployed for that for that process. Yes, that's a really, really great one. Someone just mentioned gaming platforms. Definitely. We're seeing that a lot. Um, Xbox Live, definitely um, Snapchat. Um, uh, you can include Snapchat within sort of social media of Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, um, Facebook. There are new and emerging social media technologies as well. So um, maybe you've had instances where those have been um, brought up in terms of uh, the uh, school um, Reddit fake requests to be roasted. Yeah. Fortnite game. Yeah. So the gaming platforms are definitely a big one. And I know that there is sort of the ability to, uh, we're going to talk about the ability to remain anonymous, but there's within the gaming platforms, you can have um, sort of visual, textual type bullying that occurs, but you can also have verbal because um, sometimes people are playing the games with audio components um, and, and, and that comes in. Um, so memes, yeah, so Facebook people love to post memes that could be interrupted um, um, about the workplace. Um, Yes, so memes are kind of a form of digital communication. Um, and so this sort of um, uh, what, what people have termed mimetic warfare, warfare. So it's the use of memes to, to bully or to, or to sort of you know, wage war on, on someone um, through online, uh, online platforms. So yes, memes are definitely a part of that. Um, GIFs. So gifts are when um, uh, the image is is um, is mobile in motion, um, usually short little um, um, uh, video pieces, uh, sort of amount to gifts. Um, that's something that's being utilized as well. And then in the context of memes and gifts, um, what we're also seeing is what people have termed digital um, blackface or digital. Um, uh, red face, but more predominantly digital blackface, where people uh, predominantly um, not people who are not of the same um, uh, ethnic or racial background as the person within the meme or GIF are using that to indicate some type of of commentary or humor um, in society, and and so like what we'll see is that. You know, a lot of times there may be, um, uh, you know, white males or white females that are using um, gifts of predominantly the um, uh, African American how, um, housewives from Real Housewives of Atlanta to convey their to convey some type of messaging, um, and and people have been labeling that as sort of digital blackface, kind of going back to a period within American history where we had instances of, of, of minstrel shows and, and really the, the defamation of, of, um, uh, of black identity, African-American identity um, uh, because of sort of Jim Crow laws and, and just a really deep legacy there. Um, and now we're starting to see that kind of reoccur sort of this, through this digital blackface of these memes and gifts. And so that's something to pay attention to. Also later on when we talk about microaggressions, the digital blackface can be a form of a racial microaggression. Um, are there other instances that maybe we didn't mention just there of other technologies that people sh uh, feel we should be aware of? Okay, great. Well, thank you for participating um, on that. So, um, just to note some differences between, so how do we I think we know how we got to cyberbullying as sort of our advancements in technology, but it also stems from, you know, from something that has previously happened in our society of bullying. Um, and bullying is really, it's, it's direct. Um, it occurs in person. Um, there's often a fear of, of retribution that's associated with it. Um, it can be physical in terms of hitting, punching, and shoving. There's also verbal bullying in terms of teasing, name calling, and gossip. And then there was the nonverbal uh, forms of, of bullying in terms of use of gestures and, um, and, and exclusion. Exclusionary practices are also a form of bullying. 
Um, you can find more information about this on Stop Bullying Now. Um, so cyberbullying, though, on the other hand, is anonymous, and that's a big part of this um, this evolution. Now, not all cyberbullying is anonymous, um, but what we are seeing is that there is a greater um, trend towards uh, anonymity within cyberbullying, and 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 the ramifications, the far-reaching ramifications of cyberbullying, um, are are very much linked to the anonymity that's associated with it. Um, it occurs in digital spaces. Um, I say digital, not not online, because it can be through cell phones, it can be through you know the gaming platforms, it can be through you know online instances, it can be through a laptop, it could be Bluetooth devices. Um, someone taking over your 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 hacking your Fitbit and and maybe um, releasing your your personal information from your health app. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in which um, cyberbullying can occur. And so it's more thinking about these, these new digital spaces that we're creating. Um, sometimes uh, there is not a non-reporting of cyberbullying because um, there can be a fear of loss of technology privileges. This comes most frequently with children um, or with youth who don't have the main authority over their, their tools. Um, our conversation today is very fluid. Um, it looks both at youth and, um, and families who may be um, uh, uh, getting care through systems of care, but it also is about our workplaces and about our, how we relate to each other through um, our um, leadership and administrators, but, and also at the staff level. Um, and within that, um, there's also you know, technology rules about use rules and privileges within the workplace. Um, and, and a fear of, of maybe how um, there could be retribution through, you know, bringing attention to cyberbullying. Um, it often is sort of more under the radar, if you can even imagine that, than, than um, direct bullying. Um, it also, we have um, less understanding, although research is changing that, but it's been very difficult to understand the full ramifications of the emotional reactions uh, that people have to cyberbullying because it, it sort of it can occur in that anonymous space or in, the, in these digital spaces. But we are seeing a lot more um, studies and research, uh, both um, immediate studies as well as longitudinal studies that are really looking at the, the impacts of cyberbullying. Um, some similarities, they both deal with one person taking um, uh, or attacking another psychologically. Um, students uh, can deal with both through intervention. So if we think about, you know, how this occurs in schools, um, you know, there are some intervention policies and programs that can be put in place. Um, and cyberbullying and bullying, although we often associate it with schools, it can occur after school, it can occur in workplaces, it can occur, you know, um, after work and not just during work because we really are seeing with the, the digital component of this, um, we are so connected to our devices that it's really hard to, um, to disconnect and deconnect from those devices. And therefore, it makes us much more prone um, to uh, cyberbullying and to these instances of harm um, because you know, we are co consistently putting ourselves in these digital spaces. Um, technology, uh, can make people feel anonymous. This is sort of one of the differences from bullying. Um, technology also can involve can involve a larger number number of people. So sometimes, in the traditional instances of bullying, we see that occur within um, a one to one, or maybe on a smaller group aspect, or, or, or between groups. But what we don't, um, what what is um, maybe it, what's differentiating for cyberbullying is that, you know, this can get into sort of thousands, even millions of people, depending on sort of the viral nature of whatever is, whatever type of um, bullying is occurring, whether that be a, maybe someone creates a meme or a GIF, um, the president retweets something or, or tweets something, um, and we really can see a much, much larger group of people becoming involved in the practice of cyberbullying. Um, also, the process of um, trolling, we'll, we'll talk about the different types of cyberbullying, but um, 
yeah, th those come in. And then, so lastly, regular bullying can have a physical aspect as well. So I don't want to discount, though, that cyberbullying has a physical aspect. Um, I think that sometimes cyberbullying can lead to um, a, a physical aspect, whether it be in person. Um, I think there's also a connection between bullying and cyberbullying in terms of um, some of the, the violent uh, videos that we see occur, uh, whether those be school fights or, or you know, fights, you know, uh, um, in a street or be just between youth or, or, or full grown adults. Um, the way in which those are those um, violent videos are being shared and circulated through technology also contribute um, to these aspects of bullying. Um, So now we'll move into the types, as I've mentioned. So there's flaming. Um, these are online fights uh, using electronic messages with angry and vulgar language. Um, there can be harassment. This is repeatedly sending offensive, rude, and insulting messages. There's cyber stalking. Um, this is repeatedly sending messages that include threats of harm or are highly intimidating, engage in, engaging in other online activities that make a person afraid. Um, for his or her own safety. Um, there can also be a sexual connotation to this. Um, and so thinking about sexual safety and, and cyber stalking, um, that, that's important to, to note. Um, there is denigration, um, dissing someone online, sending or posting cruel gossip or rumors about a person to damage his or her reputation or friendships. Uh, there's then impersonation. This is pretending to be someone else and sending or posting material online that makes that person look bad, gets that person in trouble or danger or damages that person's reputation or friendships. Um, there's outing and trickery, sharing someone's secret or embarrassing information online, tricking someone into revealing secrets or embarrassing information, which is then shared online. Exclusion, intentionally excluding someone from an online group, like a buddy list. Um, we see this sometimes too with, with Facebook groups, although um, our current generation of youth sort of in, in school now, if you're thinking about youth, um, they're, they're, we're seeing a decline in their, in their use and participation on Facebook. Um, but there's other sort of group chats and ways in which um, people can be um, uh, excluded from online spaces. Uh, maybe there's a group chat, group text, or something that we see. Also, youth being um, no, uh, referencing as a as a uh, as a form of ex um, a space of exclusion. And then um, that's just uh, some more information. There's um, the Center for Safe and Responsible Internet Use is a really great resource for learning more about some of the uh, current issues related to these topics and and finding out more if you so choose. Um, when we think about some of the effects of bullying, um, sort of, if you haven't really sort of circled back around to why this is important within systems of care, and um, you know, later on we'll have some opportunity for a bit of a Q&A because I think each of you probably came today with some thoughts or, or concerns or, or um, experiences that you wanted to um, share or see addressed or, or have a query about. Um, and and so I think you have your own insights onto why this topic is so important within systems of care. But I also wanted to just highlight some of the health impacts um, related to bullying. So people who are bullied have a higher risk of depression and anxiety, including, um, uh, including the fact that these symptoms may persist into adulthood. Um, so there's increased feelings of sadness and loneliness after being a victim of bullying, um, changes in sleep and eating patterns, loss of interest in activities, um, we also see that there can be increased thoughts of su about suicide, so suicidal ideation is a, con is a, 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 um, a factor with, with people who are bullied. Um, they are more likely to have health complaints, um, so are also more likely to retaliate through extreme violent measures when we think about safe schools and school safety and really even just community safety. Um, a lot of some of the extreme violence that we've seen in, in our world lately, um, you know, does have oftentimes an, an online digital space presence. 
um, uh, as a result of cyberbullying or some other type of, of aggression that's occurred within a digital space. So more effects of bullying, um, people who bully others have a higher risk of abusing alcohol and other drugs in adolescence and as adults. Um, they are more likely to get into fights, to vandalize property, and um, uh, have a higher um, uh, dropout rate for schools. Um, we also see that um, people who bully others are more likely to have convictions and traffic citations as adults are more likely to be abusive toward their romantic partners, spouses, or children as adults. When we think about domestic violence and really trying to combat that within our communities, this is something to really consider. Um, so that was a really um, brief introdu introduction to, um, to bullying and to cyberbullying. And I wanted to leave some space you know, before we move on to um, a new emerging aspect of cyberbullying on microaggressions for um, those that are participating on the call to identify some concerns or issues that you've noticed um, either through systems of care or your own work if it sits outside of systems of care um, related to emerging concerns around bullying and particularly cyberbullying. And if there's any questions or things that you'd like us to explore um, maybe th uh, later on in the presentation or right now, I'll give some space for you to type those into the chat box. So we have a question, um, is there a way to make sure all parties are accountable for the outcome of cyberbullying? It's a really great question. Um, let's think about what we, what we might define as all parties. Um, there's a portion later in the presentation where um, I have some um, groups maybe identified in terms of our schools and, and our providers and ourselves as families and, and youth partners. Um, and, and there's some recommendations there, but if there are additional parties that you're thinking of, it looks like in juvenile probation, it seems as though, as though it is always the bully party that ends up with us. Yeah, I, um, that's a really, really um, great insight. So I think that's something that we should, um, we should definitely flag for, for further conversation. And if others have ideas on sort of um, uh, responses to, um, to, to this comment or want to add some insights related to that in the chat box, um, feel, feel free to add that, um, but I'll flag that for further follow-up. Do you talk at all about the witnesses or bystanders of bullying? My understanding is that they have some typical long-lasting effects. Um, definitely, there are, there are studies that have been done that look at bystanders, bystander impacts of bullying um, and witnesses. I think one of the really interesting things with that is we've seen those studies done within the um, sort of more traditional sense of bullying of person to person or, or, or occurring within physical spaces and not digital spaces. But in this new era of cyberbullying, and when we think about um, the prevalence of these types of um, bullying communications, on um, in digital spaces and on cyber platforms where something might just come up on your newsfeed um, and you you know whether that's Facebook or maybe some other type of live feed for another social media app and you have no real control over that because it's an algorithm that's already being developed by the you know by the um, by the product and by the by the social media platform as to sort of what you'll see now there's some ways that you can control that ag algorithm and you can kind of look up some tricks to that but when we think about microaggressions, which is a, a great segue to the next portion, it's really difficult to kind of, to turn off um, our witnessing to many of these acts of, of harm and, and harmful language um, in, in digital spaces because of the way that the platforms have been constructed. And so we sometimes see that as, um, as digital fatigue 
is, is, a, is a term that, that's come up. Um, there's also um, the, the trauma, there, there's now sort of um, studies around the uh, trauma of social media and trauma of racial microaggressions that occur within social media. Um, so people can really even get burnout, and especially if it's, a, a, you know, in instances there's been some studies related to um, Black Lives Matter um, and some of our other social justice movements that have been occurring recently, even um, like with um, the Me Too movement. Um, people who participate in digital spaces to advocate for these movements are also becoming um, uh, having mental health and, and, and other types of health impacts because of sort of the, the barrage of, of, of cyberbullying and trolling and other types of um, bullying tactics that can occur in digital spaces. Um, those are like, you know, in, in that instance, those are people that are, that are engaged in the movements. But then there are also people who um, peripherally may be engaged. You know, they're not necessarily an advocate, but they're friends of an advocate online. And so that advocate's experiences come up in their live feed, um, and that advocate may be a person of color, they're a person of color, and they're being trolled um, in, in a racist fashion just because of their skin color. Um, that has, a, that has um, a health impact on, on those individuals who are seeing that come up in their live feed. And that's something that's of an emerging concern and more studies are, be, are beginning to emerge related to sort of the, um, the overwhelming impacts of, of these sort of aggressions. Um, so I've said microaggressions quite a few times already, so I wanna make sure I provide you with a definition. So um, this, there's a few images that I'll show in the remainder of the presentation. Um, and this one uh, is kind of indicative of that. Um, you know, here's a, a young woman. Uh, you're the whitest black person I know. Um, this is a sort of a type of microaggression that can be said in a digital or physical space. Um, and this was something that, that she wrote down as, as being something she had heard. Um, so microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults for people of color. Um, and I'm going to try and have us think we might be able to see a video. So I'm going to try and have us play this video. I hope it works. Um, if, you, if it doesn't and you can type into the chat box that you're not hearing any sound, let me know. Good day, everyone. My name is Daryl Wingsu, and I am a professor of psychology and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I am also author of Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Microaggressions and Marginality. Today, I would like to share with you some... Okay, so it looks like we have no sound. Um, let's see, did anyone else hear the video at all? Oh, we said someone could hear it. I could hear it. I heard it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so if you couldn't hear it, I, I, you know, I apologize, but I'm gonna press play again and we'll just keep it going. Um, there are closed captionings if you want to um, just uh, read along. Some of the harmful impact that microaggressions have on marginal. Oh, okay, so we had an issue there. Let's try it one more time. Good day, everyone. My name is Daryl Wingsu, and I am a professor of psychology and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I am also author of Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Microaggressions and Marginality. Today, I would like to share with you some of the harmful impact that microaggressions have on marginalized groups in our society. But what are microaggressions? Well, microaggressions are the everyday slights, indignities, put downs, and insults that people of color, women, LGBT populations, or those who are marginalized experience in their day-to-day -day interactions with people. 
Microaggressions oftentimes appear to be a compliment, but contain a metacommunication or a hidden insult to the target groups in which it is delivered. People who engage in microaggressions are ordinary folks who experience themselves as good, moral, decent individuals. Microaggressions occur because they are outside the level of conscious awareness of the perpetrator. In this scene, Michael, an Asian American graduate student, is receiving academic counseling from his sponsor. They have a pleasant conversation. At the end of their meeting, the advisor delivers what he believes to be a compliment to Michael by stating, quote, you know you speak excellent English, end quote. Michael is disturbed because it seems to imply that he is not a true American and that he is a perpetual alien in his own country. Microaggressions can also be delivered non-verbally through unconscious behaviors or gestures. In this scene, Jenny has finished a late night at the office and awaits the elevator. As the door opens, she takes one step forward, sees a black male rider, hesitates, and immediately clutches her purse and places her hand over her necklace. The hidden communication is that African Americans are prone to crime, will break the law, are up to no good, and will steal. Gender microaggressions occur also frequently to women. In this scene, Laura, a female manager, sits with her male colleagues in a meeting with the president. Note that the men tend to talk to one another, cut her off in mid-sentence, and that the president addresses only the males in the group. When Laura attempts to contribute to the discussion, she is oftentimes ignored. In one case, a male colleague checks his phone rather than listen. What can each and every one of us do to combat microaggressions? We need to realize that microaggressions are unconscious manifestations of a worldview of inclusion, exclusion, superiority, inferiority. Thus, our major task is to make the invisible visible. There are, in essence, five things that we need to do individually. First, learn from constant vigilance of your own biases and fears. Second, Experiential reality is important in interacting with people who differ from you in terms of race, culture, ethnicity. Thirdly, don't be defensive. Fourthly, be open to discussing your own attitudes and biases and how they might have hurt others or in some sense revealed bias on your part. Lastly, it is very important to be an ally. Stand personally against all forms of bias and discrimination. I wrote two books, Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Microaggressions and Marginality to help us combat microaggressions at the individual, institutional, and societal level. If we are to become a fair, just, and humane society, I hope each and every one of you will join me in this important journey. Thank you. Okay, so that is uh, Daryl Wingsu. He really is credited as being um, the, the originator of this concept of microaggressions as it pertains to um, to our understandings of bullying and cyberbullying and, and more broadly um, our understandings of um, communication um, among our communities and societies and especially within schools and, and workplace environments. Um, so, and you can also purchase his books. So those two books, um, uh, Daryl Wingsu, um, if you type in Daryl Wingsu Microaggressions on Amazon, um, his books are available for purchase if this is something that you want to explore more. Um, this is just a bit of a, um, a, a diagram of some of the racial microaggressions that can manifest in our society and that do. Um, and so uh, there's the micro insult, which is often unconscious, the, the micro assault, which is often conscious, and then the micro invalidation, which is often unconscious. So I wonder if in for, if for a few minutes, you might take a chance in the chat box and just type in any experiences or, or, or you know, things that have been raised to your consciousness about a microaggression that either you've experienced or you know someone else has experienced.
So we have someone who said all Asians are smart. Um, I am visually impaired and people talk to me like I am hard of hearing. Yeah. A staff member looked at another staff member and questioned if she was a sub because she was a different race. So those are, are really strong examples. If you have additional ones, please feel free to share them in, in the chat box. It does help us to uh, to gain a greater collective understanding and sort of learn publicly. Um, one says that I'm a that I'm a that I'm judgmental because I'm Christian. Um, nail contractors talk to my husband, even though I used to do construction. Yes, I've I've, I've heard that one um, as well. Um, it you know just in terms of uh, how microaggressions can manifest, um, you know, in our home lives, in our work lives. Uh, uh, people have mentioned sort of school references. Um, and now within sort of our digital world, we are seeing these, these types of uh, references and aggression replicated in digital spaces as they sort of, we once experienced them maybe person to person or within, or sort of within group dynamics, they're now being sort of exported into digital spaces. Um, one of the things to note for micro insults, uh, these are behavioral verbal remarks. Um, micro assaults, these are explicit racial um, derogations. Um, and then for micro invalidation, oh, uh, comments or behaviors, um, oh. verbal comments or behaviors that um, exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or um, reality of a person of color. Um, now, I would say that initially, um, Daryl Wingsu conceived of this as racial microaggressions, but I also think that we're starting, you know, these, he mentions how these are replicated, you know, based on, on gender and the other sort of cultural identifiers that we all carry. So gender, maybe sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, um, it could be our age. So I think microaggressions have sort of, our understanding of them at least, have grown quite significantly. Um, so next, these are just some additional examples of potential microaggressions that can occur. Um, so saying to someone who's Asian, Latino, or Native American, why are you so quiet? We want to know what you think, be more verbal, speak up more. Um, oftentimes, or, or, or if you hear someone speaking a different language, sometimes uh, commonly we will hear someone say, uh, speak English. Um, and really the coded message that that microaggression is saying is, you know, assimilate to the dominant culture. Um, leave your cultural heritage behind. Um, there's really no room for it or no space for it. Um, we often sometimes hear, uh, you know, a faculty of color is mistaken for a service worker. There's been, um, you know, also with the advancements of technology has also been our ability to capture through video and photo a lot more instances of these of these biases and these aggressions and these forms of bullying that are occurring in our society. So um, not only are faculty of color sometimes mistaken and for service workers or teachers being mistaken, um, even maybe you had a coworker who might might not have been led into the building, you know, um, everyone may have a have a, a key card, but you know, how many times are uh, people of color um, who, who work there flagged to show their ID card versus non persons of color. Um, and, and so these are these instances where uh, people of color are, you know, are made to feel like they have to be servant to, um, to sort of a dominant population, oftentimes that may be a white population. Um, and so to, so to think about that. Um, and I think there are also ways where, you know, this isn't just based on race, right? It, it, we, we think of culture also based in terms of economic terms and, and religion. So, um, you know, what are the microaggressions that someone um, who is from the Amish or Mennonite community might face within our society? What are some of the um, microaggressions that um, someone who is from rural Pennsylvania might face versus someone who's from Philadelphia or, or Pittsburgh? Um, these are these are questions that we need to ask ourselves and, and to be more conscious of the way in which sometimes we, you know, we all have probably committed a microaggression towards someone else. Um, and, and we just didn't realize it. We weren't, we, we haven't really sort of uh, taken the, the time to continually build our consciousness to be aware that 
maybe something that was taught to us is, is not actually ethically right or moral or the standard by which we should be holding ourselves moving into the future. Um, so I, I like these, uh, these slides. They give you some examples of types of microaggressions. Um, one of the ones I wanted to point out here is around color blindness. So sometimes these are statements that indicate uh, that a white person does not want to acknowledge race. Um, and it doesn't necessarily just have to be a white person. I think it can be any person who says that they don't want to acknowledge race. Um, and so they might say something like, oh, like when I look at you, I don't see color. America is a melting pot. Um, there, you know, there's only one race, the human race. This is sort of, these are microaggressions that, that sort of form under this theme of colorblindness. Um, and really, and it also depends on the larger context within which is, is, is said. I don't think that, you know, you can never say that America is a melting pot. But so it really depends on, on the context. But for a lot of people, that, that can be seen as a microaggression, that, that comment, um, because it denies a person's uh, racial and ethnic experiences, their cultural understandings. Um, and, it, and sometimes if you really do think about the physical process of, of a melting pot, you're trying to melt people or melt things together to be of one substance, to sort of create a new substance. Um, and so for some people that can mean, you know, assimilation and, um, um, and having to sort of strip themselves of their cultural identities. So is this subjective then? That's, that's a really uh, good um, question. Um, I don't think microaggressions are subjective in the context of cyberbullying and bullying. I think you, um, if, if you take it in terms of the previous examples of the types of bullying that occur, um, so if your microaggressions are consistent, deliberate, being um, done electronically within digital spaces, so I, I think there's this level of, of consistent pursuit of someone um, or, or of a group that lends itself to not being subjective and to actually being able to label this as, as microaggressions and as bullying. Now, um, where it may be subjective is if it's, if it's sort of a misstep that happens once, um, maybe it's something in the workplace or in school and there's corrective action and people are able to sort of have that cultural humility to learn together and then to be responsive to each other's concerns. Um, and then sort of grow and adopt new language from there, then that's where it's okay to sort of have a bit of subjectivity to, to this conversation. But at the point where someone tells you, you've offended me, this, you know, this is, you know, this is a microaggression, um, then, uh, then that's really where we, you know, you have to sort of take a step back and say, okay, well, how can I be reframing my language uh, to be more inclusive? Um, and I think that's especially within systems of care that that's important because uh, we are working to enhance the delivery of care for all um, youth and families that, that, are, that are coming um, and, and seeking services. And, and even not even just those that are seeking services, but the communities that then support um, those, in, those individuals and families who, who are in need of services. So I think because we work in these spaces, we have an added level of, um, of moral responsibility to, to raise our consciousness and to be aware. And, you know, one of, and that's sort of really where the principle and standard within the National Class, stand, uh, class Standards, Culturally and, Lingu and Linguistically Appropriate Services through SAMHSA comes in to say that this is a principle that we need to he adhere to within mental and behavioral health. Um, so we have some questions here. Oh, um, so um, that was, uh, seem to the su subjective questions seem to be answered. So where does the line between microaggression and outright bullying cross? Um, I think in a lot of ways they are they are fluid, and I would I would I would ask you to say okay. So when you say outright bullying, is that sort of bullying in person, cyberbullying? Maybe it's both. Um, I think that if if it constitutes a microaggression, you are it is a form of bullying. Now, I think what we're going to talk about later is what type of justice or remediation should we be seeking for microaggressions and for bullying in our society. And I think at that point, that you know, when we when we start to assess sort of like where are the lines, that it's really more of a of a justice question about you know how do we you know if we have an instance of of microaggression and and bullying. 
are there different scales at which they should be addressed? And I think the answer to that is, is yes. Um, so uh, let's definitely flag that for, for coming back to it. And, and hopefully, um, if it's not clear towards the end, or if you're not able to, can, um, to uh, source an answer for that, let's definitely answer it again in the Q&A, or try to at least. Um, so the next slide, these are just some additional uh, examples, um, some, some themes that occur within microaggressions, criminality, denial of individual racism, the myth of meritocracy. Um, that one I think is really interesting. It's this idea of uh, someone might say, um, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Everyone can succeed, can, can succeed in this society if they work hard enough. Um, and I think the, um, the sort of the coded message sometimes for people when they say that is that people of color um, or those who are from uh, um, uh, disadvantaged economic backgrounds that they're somehow lazy or incompetent and that they're not hard workers. Um, and, and so we have to be careful, you know, the context by which we say things. And I think sometimes microaggressions, as you saw in the video, they're very flippant, and 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 they occur um, in in sort of um, almost like a like a sweeping moments of, of of our lives, and so that's why they're micro and they and they add up. Um, so it's this thing of if you can just sort of flippantly say that everyone can succeed in this society if they work hard enough, and sort of close off the conversation for other people to express that that's not their experience in America, then it becomes, you know, then that's sort of, again, where we sort of start to see this line drawn um, of, of identifying microaggressions. And then, again, if that's something that you persistently use as a go-to statement in a point of, of maybe conversation with someone who has a differing viewpoint from you, um, then maybe you're using it um, to, to bully. And especially if you're within a position um, and and you already have you know some type of of um, authority power wealth behind you and you're using that statement um, without consideration of how it's impacting others who don't have that same authority and power um, then that's really where we do start to see bullying come in um, so this is another one that may come up within systems of care um, you have a mental disability you seem perfectly normal to me um, and I've, I've heard a lot of our youth express that um, to, to me over the years um, uh, in our different youth networks and youth leadership programs. Um, they really feel that that's often something that, that's said to them. Um, and even for our youth that may have more of a um, intellectual development uh, disability or, or some other type of um, uh, more, um, uh, what might be perceived as a more visual um, illness, they uh, they also then sort of ex they, it's sort of two sides of the coin where they express you know uh, these microaggressions coming to them whether it's based on sort of that visual the, the, when it's based on the visual aspect of their of their health concern um, so it's something to to keep an eye out for um, I also think again this repeated flippant nature of these things um, can uh, really does constitute a big part of of their manifestation and and defining them within our world. Um, so when we also start to think about where does it cross the line, um, these are some of the microaggressions that are often said to the LGBTQ community. Um, you don't look trans. I'm not being homophobic. You're just being too sensitive. You don't act gay. Um, so who's the man in the relationship? Uh, have you ever had real sex? Um, you're too pretty to be a lesbian. And there's so many coded messages and all of these sort of horrific statements, um, but they are real life microaggressions that have been said to individuals. Um, one of the things that sort of then comes into conversation is, okay, well, well, what do you do? Like, you know, who, who actually, I think this was the question asked earlier about how do we hold all parties responsible? Well, one of the key things that we're seeing is, is more advocacy for policy and law and, 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 and legislative change. Um, so there are you know, policy and program developments that we can be doing at the school and, and office work level, but there's also things that we can be doing sort of at the state level and legislating. So 
when we look at anti-bullying laws, um, states that have laws prohibiting bullying of students on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, it's pretty few and sparing that have these laws. Um, and currently Pennsylvania does not have any laws um, prohibiting that type of bullying of students. So there's really a lot more advocacy that needs to be done. Um, the other thing that we see too um, is that under the Civil Rights Act, if the bullying or defamation um, of, a, uh, of someone based on their religion is not also tied to their race, then it's very difficult to, um, to have that uh, bullying be, um, uh, be addressed within the legal system. Um, so we often see that um, Muslim students, Muslim youth are targeted because of their religion, but unless they can connect, uh, unless there's a direct statement against their religion, or it can, they can connect it to a racial identifier, there's a really difficult time in prosecuting um, uh, any type of person-to-person of, uh, -person bullying, direct bullying, or cyberbullying um, in, in, in Pennsylvania. So that's not to leave us with a lot of sort of uh, sad thoughts. It's, it's to start to think about, okay, well, these are real issues. Racial microaggressions are, are happening. Um, there's some more examples here on the right. So how do we really try and, and combat some of this? Um, I think a really strong part of addressing our, the way in which racial microaggressions especially are manifesting online is uh, what's been termed digital citizenship. Um, which is the continue, which is um, continuously developing norms of appropriate, responsible, and empowered technology use. So it's um, it's our ability to lead and assist others in building positive digital experiences, to recognize that our actions have consequences to others, and to participate in a manner for the common good. And so, I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, does your school have a digital citizenship policy? Does your work have a digital citizenship policy? Does your System of care, like how, how do you how do you think and, and discuss digital citizenship and, and digital technologies and the way in which youth and families engage with those those technologies in relation to their to their care, um, and I think it's it's really important for us to start to have these conversations um, and really that's where it starts. Uh, today's presentation is not going to lay out a, a, a map or a one size fits all because it doesn't for how we should be addressing these concerns. But I think a, the, a, a common and um, uh, collective first step can be to start the conversation. Um, and you know, where do we draw the line between microaggressions and bullying? Well, I think we need to start to have that conversation. It might be different from county to county, and, and hopefully, maybe we'll have a we'll have a conversation at the state level where uh, where we're defining it maybe legislatively or or at least from some policy guidance. Um, so. Uh, this is just another resource at a future point in time if you have an activity or a training you want to do. Um, this one is based off of microaggression, it's microaggression bingo um, for those who um, um, are physically disabled. And so these are some of the different types of microaggressions that they have heard um, and um, or that have been expressed to them. Maybe it's also in a digital platform, online platform. Um, so if you're interested or you want more resources about, you know, microaggressions um, and, and how they manifest, there's this um, online website, it's called the Microaggressions Project, where people actually go and contribute some of the instances where they've experienced microaggressions um, or what they um, have defined as a microaggression. So it helps us to um, have a clear understanding of, of how the conversation is evolving and what constitutes a microaggression versus not. Um, one of them, is, you know, like you can see this one here, I'm probably such a racist, but a black man dressed as Santa is just wrong. Um, and so for someone that was a microaggression that they listed for themselves. And um, I think it's important, you know, and it's probably something that does come up with the conversation of microaggressions is, you know, um, former language around political correctness and sort of are we, you know, becoming sort of the, the word police. Um, I think it's different than that. I think this really is about, especially again, the, the privilege of position within which we sit as systems of care and that we are, you know, really, really structured and, and, and framed around delivering uh, culturally competent and linguistically competent care. 
um, that's why we sort of have to hold ourselves to a higher level and a higher standard when we think about the language that we use and the way in which we have conversations and and how we how we are inclusive of the of the people and the communities that we're serving. Um, now, this is not to say that you can't you know have these types of conversations or think these things or say these things in in you know in in the privacy or in, you know on your you know free time. Um, but I think you know to frame this this conversation and this project um, this webinar within the context of how you. Um, build up systems of care is really a, a great starting place um, and a great place also to frame the conversation uh, because I think you probably will get a bit of that pushback as well as is sort of you know are you being the, the the conversation police and what about the First Amendment and things like that and all of those things are are true but you know I think you know through the National Culture Linguistically Appropriate Services we are saying that there there is a standard a higher level standard that we should be striving for um so does social media affect your culture so this is the next portion of of our sort of uh, collective feedback today um do you think social media has shifted your culture has, has affected your culture if yes um how and if you want to sort of write that into the chat box um i'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this um so if we go back to the definition if culture is the set of attitudes values beliefs symbols and behaviors shared by a group of people but different for each individual and usually communicated from one generation to the next, how is social media affecting this and changing our understandings of culture? See some folks might be typing in the chat box. Give them a few more moments. Well, I think one of the key things here as well with our understanding of social media and culture is it is really physically changing how we communicate with one another, how we're um, we're transmitting our values and our attitudes and our beliefs, and we're doing it at a, at a much, much faster pace. Um, someone said, I think in one way it makes um, some be more cautious of what we share on our beliefs or thoughts as to not put ourselves out there. Yeah, and I think a big part of that is also our, our digital footprint and our digital security. We want to make sure that, you know, with the things that we are sharing online, um, that we are, that we're protecting ourselves and not maybe sharing too much information that could then be misused or mishandled by others, especially within the context of bullying. And I think, you know, another thing with that too is, um, you know, it's kind of like a, like Thumper's mom from from Bambi. Um, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And 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 that's a big part of of how we really can start a conversation on microaggressions and on bullying. And the fact that because we have access to technology into these digital spaces doesn't mean that they have to be overrun with microaggressions and with harmful language. Um, someone said, I think. Um, it is making us into um, a, a melting pot or maybe not really allowing for individuality because we're sort of all kind of cons consuming uh, this type of um, uh, information all at once. Um, I may judge some people based on a post on social media. They may or may not be accurate due to loss of face-to-face -face interactions. That is such an um, amazing point. Um, that with the viral nature that sometimes can occur on our digital spaces, um, bullying can happen much faster and often does happen much faster. But we also start to see that um, that we can prejudge people sometimes um, as well a, a lot faster. 
Um, so that's a, that's a really great point. And sometimes it takes us, you know, we're really starting to see with our news outlets as well, not all of them, but some of them, they're changing the way in which they react to these viral posts. Really, we have to do a lot more vetting and we can't even just rely on news sources to do that, vet, that, that vetting. We have to, you know, we have to have that digital citizenship. Um, we have to pause and, and really say, hmm, okay, well, let me give this a day before, you know, and some time to really form my own thoughts about what's, what's occurring before I react to, to this person, to this experience, to this post. Um, someone said, I think that social media has both enhanced and is chipping away at culture. It is a platform that you can connect to and lean into your culture with others with similar beliefs, um, et cetera. But also I think that the openness and ability to judge and bully others causes us to potentially stop and question our culture. Definitely. And there are some emerging studies as well on the way in which technology and these digital spaces are being misused for, um, for violence, you know, and, and even going past bullying, um, but to, you know, um, uh, coordinated extremist violence um, that we might see in terms of, um, you know, one recent study that's come out, and I think this is why um, Facebook has is contemplating instituting some changes. Um, I think Twitter also has in terms of their community agreements. Um, these are these are concerns that these social media platforms are having to address now in the way in which they are enabling, you know, uh, white supremacist extremist. Uh, sort of domestic terrorism um, groups who sort of are founded on kind of neo-Nazism and white supremacy, how they're sort of fostering these digital spaces for that type of harmful language and then sort of an actual um, planning and then execution of violence in the country. Um, so, so yeah, there are positives. It also has brought a lot of people together and given people a voice that maybe haven't had one before to raise um, awareness about issues affecting their community, but um, but as digital citizens, we we still have to have some boundaries and, and be cautious. Um, people have less face to face time. Someone said less live conversations, and people expect you to be on Facebook to know that their, um, for instance, that their dad may have died um, uh, because it is easier that way than sort of having those those one on ones. And yeah, it's really difficult, and that's behavior, you know, are being We also, uh, someone said, some people hide behind social media and say things uh, they might not say to a person's face. Yes, that anonymity is a big part of, of the cyberbullying, as well as the microaggressions. Um, I think people are able to be more flippant, more off the cuff. Um, within social media, or at least they feel they can be. And so that, that also is why we're seeing maybe a rise in some of what's labeled as sort of these racial microaggressions in online digital spaces. Um, Cyberbullying separates the bully from the victim. They don't have to see the results and can write it off easily. That's, that's really, really true. Um, there's so many examples, unfortunately, of this. Um, one of the ones, you know, that was really kind of a catalyst for us uh, having this webinar, we had had, you know, um, individuals across Pennsylvania that had expressed interest in, in this topic, um, but also that um, a, a nine-year-old girl in, in Alabama um, committed suicide after being bullied by an email by her classmates. So these are nine-year-old, ten-year-old children um, that are bullying each other, um, and she was bullied because she, um, she was an African-American girl and she was riding to school with a white boy. Um, and, and, and that was not something that was accepted by her peers and, and made her a victim of their bullying. Um, another person said, I see young people being less confident about the person-to-person -person conventions that allow us to be comfortable speaking directly to one another. Yes, and so we really have to think about, um, you know, I don't necessarily, know that we should be advocating for, for countering or trying to sort of reclaim some of our, some of these sort of person to person um, conventions, but maybe we should be. That's, some, that's a point of conversation. Um, and what, what does that look like though? You know, what types of um, programs can we put in place to empower youth and families to sort of feel more comfortable in those person to person conventions? Because, you know, there are some families 
who um, only want to be only want text messages. They don't want phone calls or or, or vice versa. Um, or maybe they just want to be communicated with through email. So yeah, our behaviors and how we communicate with one another is definitely shifting and changing. Um, well, thank you for those responses. Please, if you feel like you want to um, keep adding to that list, go, go for it. Um, in terms of system of care values, we really are to be youth and family driven, community based, and culturally and linguistically competent. And I think all of these principles, all of these core values come back to our ability to be have safe and welcoming digital space environments. So some recommendations. I think we can put forward some recommendations for schools, for our communities, for policymakers, for researchers, and then for providers. And there's probably so many more groupings that we could have here. Um, so um, when the time comes, feel free to add sort of other, other um, groups or, or people you think really should be working on this and making change. So for families, um, I wanted you to be aware of this FYI, uh, the Family and Youth Institute has a pre bullying prevention toolkit. Um, and so for families, it's really important to be aware of the signs of bullying or discrimination experienced by children or youth um, and not to minimize their experiences. I think sometimes uh, as, as family members, we wanna try and, and relate um, by sort of sharing our experiences, but if you're sharing something, and especially if it's an experience of bullying that existed prior to the digital age, prior to these new digital technologies, it's really hard to make a correlation or to uh, compare the two. And I think actually recognizing that, you know, I've had this experience, but it actually isn't the same as yours, will go leaps and bounds for making, for empowering your, your young person and, um, and for connecting. Um, also work on developing an open relationship um, and so that they can feel comfortable about sharing these experiences in the future. Um, so, yeah, just making sure that, you know, this is something that's a part of, you know, how we're parenting in, in, in the 21st century. Um, do you others, if you have um, other ideas on ways that families can be working to prevent um, bullying or be aware of bullying, especially within digital spaces and microaggressions. If you want to add those to the chat box, feel free to add those now. When we think about schools, um, uh, they can often implement anti-bullying programs um, to incorporate identity-based bullying and discrimination um, and explicitly mention protected groups in the school's bullying policy, even if those groups aren't necessarily protected within um, state or federal legislation, you know, we can do our part, we sort of within our school communities, within our local communities to develop policies that say, hey, you know, this is the standard we're, we're going to set for ourselves. Um, mentoring programs and then also community intercultural and interfaith initiatives. So thinking about how you can get people together from different backgrounds, from different cultures, to share, to exchange, to learn from one another. The more we have those experiences, I, I personally really do feel that we will see a, a decline in, um, in, the, um, in, our, in the rates of cyberbullying and the rates of bullying. Again, it's about those sort of creating those spaces for those to rebuild those person-to-person -person conventions and comfort levels and understandings of, of how to uh, relate to one another and connect to one another. Policymakers. Um, so we really need to work on work on expanding the definition of bullying um, by the Department of Education from incidents in which one's religion is um, explicitly stated to include those incidents when it's non-explicit. And this is just across the board. Um, I think non-explicit forms of, my, of of bullying really need to be addressed. Um, uh, this, uh, and, but this is just one example. There's probably a lot of other ways that we could legislate, create guidance within administrative guidance within our agencies like the Department of Education or within SAMHSA that really starts to address some of these issues related to bullying that we're seeing in our um, communities. Um, we also need to advocate for new bullying laws for emerging technology. Um, so in terms of the different types of bullying that can occur, whether it's impersonation or cyber stalking, we are seeing more laws around cyber stalking. 
um, and, and some of the instances around that, and also sexting, which is sort of sending uh, sexually explicit content through text messages. There are more laws that are coming into place related to that um, uh, to protect our vulnerable populations, but we, there are more that are needed. Um, and so if you have ideas for how schools as well as policymakers could be addressing some of these issues, please feel free to also uh, type those into the chat box. For researchers, um, we really think that there needs to be more research on some of the protective factors within various micro and macro systems, um, as well as examinations of effectiveness to mitigate the negative effects of bullying. So we may not be able to eradicate bullying, um, and, and I don't necessarily know that that's something um, that we are striving for. Um, I think there's a lot of philosophical underpinnings to that and utopianism, but what we do need to, what we are working towards is, is making sure that we are, are limiting this really harmful um, practice with, with, you know, within our schools, within our work environments, within our society more broadly, um, and protecting people and, and creating protective factors uh, that enable people to be resistant to bullying, um, to um, have um, uh, less health impacts because of bullying and microaggressions. Um, so if you have ideas for other ways that researchers could be working on this topic, I know, you know, even more studies about the impact of witnesses to bullying and how they deal with this type of, of trauma and harm, I, I think was mentioned earlier. Um, feel free to type any of those sort of other considerations for researchers into the chat box. Um, the last one that we tackled here, but you can, uh, you can, you might definitely have other ideas um, in terms of other uh, people and, and groups that should be working on this or providers. Um, so one thing is to think about, do you have a workplace code of conduct that mentions or includes something about digital citizenship or digital use of digital technologies? Um, you know, we are really seeing a large footprint of people can maybe think that they're doing something offline now, um, not offline, but um, out of work, but online or in a digital space and that they're not going to have ramifications for that um, within their workplace and they actually do. And so I think being upfront and clear about what your workplace code of conduct is, the, the, the standard of care um, for your digital citizenship that you're holding your employees to is important. Um, also looking to see if you have like a welcome or safe environment policy and that whether or not that extends to digital environments and digital spaces. Um, trainings like today, hosting trainings, um, participating in trainings, making uh, um, staff, administrators, and partners aware of different types of trainings. Um, and then if you have other ideas, or maybe you've uh, personally done some type of project or worked on an event related to um, combating cyberbullying and, um, and microaggressions and thinking about digital space um, safety, uh, please feel free to share those in the chat box. I'm just going to turn to the chat box to see if we have, um, so no one just yet, but feel free to write in if you have additional ideas or things that have really worked well for you, policies or programs that you've implemented related to uh, cyberbullying, microaggressions, digital spaces, um, we'd love to, to learn, learn, learn with you um, and, and hopefully learn from your successes and or your challenges. Um, some tools to combat cyberbullying uh, that we wanted you to be aware of. Um, engage in participatory planning. So that's where, you know, when I said start the conversation, maybe it's with your county leadership team, maybe it's with your staff um, at a team, team staff meeting. Really think about how do we, you know, what are, how are we defining these, these, these topics? How are we engaging with them? Are we even aware that they exist? Um, you can conduct a needs assessment. Uh, sometimes this also can be uh, self-assessments or bias assessments with staff. I don't really like to call them bias assessments. I think it's really a self-assessment about understanding, you know, you know, your unconscious biases, maybe even your strengths related to intercultural um, uh, differences and how you navigate those. So self-assessments are really helpful. Um, and then they can kind of pinpoint maybe where you're seeing microaggressions manifest in the workplace or in digital spaces. 
Uh, one of the things I also wanted to note is, um, so this is ensure that there's an effective anti-bullying program in place. Um, one of the things I wanted to note related to digital spaces, microaggressions, bullying, is also for our frontline staff workers to think about the way in which any of your frontline staff workers might be contributing to microaggressions. Um, both in person, but also in, in online spaces or in email communications. Um, now that necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, getting to the level of bullying youth or families that may be seeking services, but they might be committing a microaggression. And again, as those microaggressions add up and add up and add up, they can cause, um, you know, mental fatigue and, 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 and health impacts to, to those who are the recipients of those aggressions. So, if you have, if you're servicing, um, uh, you know, um, a black family, and you constantly ask if they're on, you know, um, uh, some type of, of public assistance, um, or you just sort of assume that they are on um, some type of public assistance, or you assume that they live in a certain neighborhood in your conversations with them. So these can be flippant um, microaggressions that occur, but if they're consistent, and maybe if the family member addresses it, or the family addresses it, and it's not your behavior doesn't change, then that's really where it gets to an added level of concern. Um, also in emails, um, you maybe think in terms of unconscious bias, how do you address emails? Are the way in which you're addressing emails to families of, of color or families who are from um, a, a different economic or religious background different than how you're addressing families who might represent the more uh, dominant um, uh, cultural background of your community. Um, so these are things to consider. Review policies and procedures. Uh, that's where you can sort of put in these, these, these um, uh, codes of conduct and digital citizenship policies. Um, conduct professional development, so trainings and, and really educating people about this topic. Um, and then uh, also evaluation. So incorporating um, your digital footprint, your digital citizenship, a cyberbullying into your evaluation processes. Um, make sure that you're asking youth and family members about these concerns um, and, and, and also that it's something that's incorporated into your evaluation of staff and, um, and their knowledge of, of the topic. So um, before we sort of open it up to our discussion period for the remainder of the webinar, we just wanted to let you know again that this is an ongoing journey that you're on. Um, it's not a checkbox, and um, we know that you probably you probably are going to leave today with more questions than when you came when you signed on. Uh, but uh, ultimately, that's actually a, a really good um, that's a really good uh, outcome for us. Is that is that if you do leave with more questions than you came in, and, and more things that you want to go and and, and find out about or explore in your in your community and how these topics apply there, that really for us is, is a measure of success um, to, to recognize that uh, we don't have all the solutions and that collectively we, we probably can find some really great ones and, and innovate together. So it's about being committed to change, um, working together, and really trying to shift our policies and our practices to be more inclusive. So our attitudes must change, our policies must change, and our practices must become more congruent with the diversity that's uh, uh, situated in, in our unique uh, communities and counties and, and state and, and nation. Um, and ultimately, we're doing this work because we're really trying to make sure that we are more helpful than harmful. Um, so uh, before we send you off uh, for the day, we're just going to open it up to, to questions. Um, I will unmute everyone. and. Um, or actually, um, I won't unmute everyone, but if you would like to unmute yourself, uh, you're welcome to ask a question um, using uh, your phone or your microphone, um, or you can type a question into the chat box and I can uh, answer it that way. So this is Mark. There was just a, a comment that came in that uh, the, 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 
information you provided has a, a lot more uh, complications um, than, than always than what can sometimes seem on the surface. Um, and you mentioned that this was three of three trainings. Um, will you be offering the first two again? Um, do you want, I can go over that or we can always provide um, to the group um, the links to the other two trainings. We, they are on our website. I'll uh, put them in, in the uh, message uh, box real quick of the location where you can actually uh, review them and uh, download them, I believe. Not download, but you can view online. I'll put them in the uh, text uh, chat box in just about uh, a minute. Yes, that would be that would be great if you can type those into the chat box. So um, thank you for, for the comment. Um, I could not say it better. The, these things are very complicated, um, but they're about starting the conversation locally um, and really trying to hone in on what's the best cultural match and fit um, and the issues of concern related to digital spaces, cyberbullying and microaggressions for where you're from, because they're going to be different for all of us and for all of our communities. Um, so this was the third of the third training. Yes, um, Mark is going to um, uh, post into the chat box. I think he might have, oh, well, he's, he'll do that soon. The link to the resource page. So um, on the PA Care Partnership website, we have a page that's dedicated to cultural and linguistic competency resources. And uh, you're welcome to go there. And we have some templates and past webinars that we've done, but also for our 2019 CLC webinar series which included a first training on unconscious bias, a second training on the culture of the family, and this third training on um, cyberbullying, microaggressions, and social media. Um, we, uh, those were all reposted um, on, on the website. Um, so after today's training, um, you, it may take us about uh, probably uh, till tomorrow to, put, to upload the third training, but it'll be available. And you can rewatch it, you can share it with others. Um, it's, it's really, um, open access uh, is how we like to code it. Um, so we've got some great thank yous and then the link was just posted. Any other questions or comments if you'd like to post into the chat box? And this is Mark. For anybody who is um, who is on the call but is looking for the information, our website is um, www.pa carepartnership.org that's pacarepartnership.org and uh, that inf and then once you go over there you can actually just look under the training tab and the CLC webinar series is the first one under the, under the training tab well thank you mark for um, for posting that um, I will just also um, remind folks that if you would like to um, get in touch with me about anything that you talked about today, um, please feel free to email me. Um, we provide technical assistance and we can have more targeted and tailored conversations related to your county or, or to your uh, provider agency's unique needs. Um, and so you can email me at Leonard, K-T, L-E-O-N-A-R-D, K-T, at upmc.edu. Um, any questions or comments or additional resources? Um, we are always looking for feedback um, related to the sessions. I think we may try and send out um, a, a survey link or something to, to get your additional feedback, but um, keep an eye out for those. And uh, lastly, if you um, loved this webinar series and are, and are wanting to know if it will be a recurring thing, um, we do do it annually. So we um, will bring it back for 2020. Um, and so that's something to, to keep in mind. And we ha we'll always have um, some additional uh, CLC um, opportunities for the remainder of 2019 that we'll keep you posted about. So um, if you are on the PA Care Partnership listserv, and that's most likely how you found out about today's webinar and uh, through your registration, um, we'll make sure to um, keep you abreast of those developments too. And so keep an eye out for CLC related emails coming from the PA Care Partnership. Well, we just want to say thank you. Um, you're welcome to sign off. I'm, I'll hang on the line for a few moments if there's anyone that wants to have a conversation or ask additional questions. All right. Well, thank you all so much for attending and uh, everyone have a, have a fantastic day. It's going to be a nice one out today.